Well, and thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here today and a pleasure to see so many friends and uh, patients that uh, I've been on retreating in my practice. I also wanted to say a word about uh, Samantha and the Voice Project. When I first came to Dallas 20 years ago, uh, Samantha was one of my memories of uh, a ball of energy and vision for what she wanted to do with uh, voice treatment in Parkinson's disease. And it's been a, a delight to see what she and her team have accomplished with their energy and their persistence and, and so on. So I'd like to talk today about, oh, one more thing about Samantha. I appreciate her flexibility. I was initially scheduled to give this uh, next month, and then through a family scheduling uh, con uh, conflict, uh, I needed to okay. change. And Samantha kindly agreed to uh, trade spots so I could talk today. So what I wanted to talk about is dystonia. <clears throat> so dystonia is a phenomenon or a symptom of impairment of movement. And to understand why dystonia can happen, I want to explain to you how movement is controlled through the part of the brain called the basal ganglia or extrapyramidal system. Because that circuitry in the basal ganglia is very important for helping somebody to perform skilled tasks. Everything from handwriting to uh, playing tennis to the Winter Olympics we're seeing now, any skilled movements like that have to be learned and finessed through the basal ganglia. And when that circuitry fails, then various abnormal movements can happen. You can get tremor, one can get slowed movements, one can get freezing, one can get chorea, including dyskinesias, and one can get dystonia. So dystonia is one of the outputs, the abnormal outputs of uh, impaired basal ganglia circuitry. Now dystonia does happen in people with Parkinson's disease, but actually people with Parkinson's disease often have many other phenomena in addition to dystonia. And in fact, many cases dystonia is so far down the list of, of problems that it's really not a focus of attention in people with Parkinson's disease. So most of the talk is going to be about dystonia in the pure culture, people who have just simple dystonia. And that's a more, um, uh, so we'll be begin the discussion about people who have dystonia who do not have Parkinson's disease. And then the last part of the lecture, I'll talk a little bit about dystonia as experienced by people who have Parkinson's disease. So today I'll, I'll try and explain what is dystonia specifically, a definition of and description of. We'll talk about what might cause it. And we'll discuss how dystonia tends to affect people, what difficulties it produces. And then we'll talk about the treatments that are available. And then finally, we'll, we'll peel off and again talk about in the specific subgroup of people with Parkinson's disease with dystonia, how it affects them and what treatments specifically in that, in that setting. At any rate, for a definition of dystonia, it is a movement disorder. Uh, it's characterized by sustained usually sustained muscle contraction. So in normal course of events, I want to reach for something or move my hand, and it's a brief normal uh, contraction that I focus contraction, we consider it. And in certain cases, it's excessive contraction that gets sustained, gets drawn in and pulled. It's so-called so co-contraction. Too many muscles are going too much. There you got dystonia. If too many muscles are moving too much, that's the nature of a dystonia. And that'll result in abnormal postures and abnormal movements. The uh, body part can be drawn into a twisted, contorted shape, and the movements can be impaired. <coughs> it tends to be somewhat patterned. Uh, you'll see some examples of this, twisting. And it can be uh, initiated or worsened with voluntary movements. So if, as I'll explain, the basal ganglia takes energy or activity, activation, from the surface of the brain, the cortex, and then it filters that activity before sending it out. When you're trying to do a task and sending activation through that circuitry, that's when the dystonia tends to come out most, and people have dystonia. If a person relaxes and doesn't try to move, dystonia tends to subside. In sleep, it's all gone. And if a person is having trouble with dystonia contraction, the best they can do is, is quit trying for a moment, and dystonia tends to quiet down again. Dystonia comes in uh, geographically or which part of the body, anatomically, how it affects a person. It can be generalized, affecting pretty well every voluntary muscle in the body. Every voluntary action in the body can be impaired. Or it can be more focal, affecting one body part or another. 
and we'll see some examples of this. First, we're going to talk about generalized dystonia. Here's a picture of a man in whom most every part of the body is affected by the overflow co-contraction of the muscles. So here's a young man who has uh, a generalized dystonia, and when he wants to move his muscles, instead of the pure activation of just the muscles he wants, too many muscles are contracting. The end result is he's got tightened, drawn, contractions, contortions of his muscles. You can see his, his right arm is, is twisting behind him, the fingers and wrists are extending. When he tries to do a, a task such as writing, he can't activate the muscles just that he wants. Instead, he activates too many, and it gets into a big, drawn-up contraction like that. So that, this guy, all act activities of his body are co-contracting. He can't focus the activation where he wants them. His problem is he wants just the hand or just the leg flexor to go, and instead, too much starts going. There's overflow activation, co-contraction, so-called. You could pause that video and play the second video, please. Thank you. Here's another young uh, person. Again, these patients don't have Parkinson's disease, of course. She has a dystonia that affects much of her body. It's quite prominent in her trunk, also in her feet, you can see, and her arms to a lesser extent, and her neck to some degree. When she starts trying to activate her muscle, for example, simple leg flexion, there's overflow into trunkal muscles and contortion and drawing, twisting, and so on. This is a... Um, of the nature of a generalized dystonia. All right, should I try advance this slide? So that's, that's generalized. Some people have impairment of all their basal ganglia and all the actions that flow through it. Other people, the impairment is more focal of just a, a specific little part of the circuitry. And so one part of the body or another might be affected. So one form of dystonia, focal dystonia would be cervical dystonia, purely of the neck. This person wants to hold their neck straight ahead, but any time they try to activate just so, it, it overactivates certain muscles and draws the neck to the side and backwards in this way. And it's a, a, a patterned, relatively sustained drawing tendency. Here's a, a limb dystonia. This is a focal dystonia. We saw the man in the previous video. He had difficulty writing. This person's only difficulty is writing. All the fingers draw up. Now, if this person tries to do another task with the hand, for example, playing the piano or typing or picking up at last, that's fine. Because his, his dystonia is, folk, is specific. It's focal for this task of handwriting. It's quite remarkable. That part of the basal ganglia is involved with learning skills, and there's a specific program for handwriting that this person learned many years ago. We'll talk about how you train that part of the brain for doing a skilled task. But that little program has gotten corrupted, is the bottom line. It's become distorted, and now when he tries to activate just the movement that you want for handwriting, too much activi activation of too many muscles happens, and it overflows in too many muscles, and it draws up in this abnormal, contorted way. And this is a writer's cramp in a medical term. When we talk about writer's cramp, we're not talking about somebody who is taking a test and writing too much and their hand becomes sore. This is a focal dystonia in which the program for writing has become corrupted. Anytime they try to activate the writing program, it turns into this just co-contraction spasm almost. And then there's eyelid dystonia, which is another focal variant. This person has a dystonia causing eyelid muscles to want to close all the time. Now, eyelid muscles closing all the time, there can be many causes for that. Some people, it's just dry eyes, or light aversion, and so on. And sometimes people have a tick. That's a different problem. But some people with dystonia manifest just purely of these eyelid muscles. They overactivate all the time to cause eyelid closure, which can lead somebody to be functionally blind, essentially. They cannot drive if you can't know when your eyes are going to close like so. So those are some examples of the nature of a dystonia. Now, to understand what's going wrong in dystonia, I'd like to explain how movement happens in the normal case, and then how it breaks down in people who have... Uh, how, uh, what are the ways it breaks down to produce a dystonia? So to do any skillful action, any walking, certainly uh, skating, uh, cycling, uh, manual tasks, 
you need to be able to activate certain muscles and then inhibit other muscles that are close by. Because there is a bit of a tendency, evolutionarily, to, to activate kind of more broadly. So what you want to be able to do at the brain level is to, to focus activation on certain levels and then inhibit the surrounding muscles. We consider it a form of a center-on, surround-off inhibition to, to make it contrast, to accentuate a movement. And that's a pretty uh, nuanced neurophysiologic function, to be able to have a center-on, a punchy activation of the muscle you want, but not overflow into other muscles, to be able to flex just that finger and that just that way without causing overflow activation of other muscles. I want to I inhibit the other muscles that are close by. That's a pretty important part of being able to execute a skilled task. And this happens at the basal ganglia. And these are the basal ganglia. There is the, in, in green, the thalamus. Uh, the blue and the purple have the globus pallidus and the putamen. That uh, part of the brain, deep in the brain, which people who have deep brain stimulation, we usually target one or more of these nuclei, are, are crucial for this task of focusing the activation. This uh, process is learned with repetitive practice. When you were a child and you first started to do a motor task, for example, uh, writing or taking a step, it was a clumsy, awkward movement, you know, swinging at things and so on. And with practice and with encouragement from your teachers and your parents, you, you, you learned what, was, what worked. What, you got a feedback. You said when you did something correct and you didn't fall down in your step, that, that produced a little brief surge of dopamine, which facilitates. That brief surge of dopamine facilitates or... or um, it's kind of like a trigger. Whatever just happened was good. It trains that part of the brain. Okay, in the same cues, with the same goal, same context, Try that again. So dopamine facilitates that pathway. So dopamine is the mechanism by which your, your circuitry trains for those sort of skilled motor tasks. A brief surge if you do it right, a brief drop if you do it wrong, and the nun smacks your hand because you didn't you know, do the right lettering or something of that nature. So that, uh, that, that process happens in the basic angle here. And this is a, a schematic of that training process or that activation process. The green arrow is like a go signal, coming from the cortex down to this cranial or spinal neurons which are going to activate your muscles. And we have a green arrow saying go to a narrow focused center, and then a, a kind of broader red arrow saying no go to the surrounding muscles. That's again crucial for a fine skilled motor task instead of a clumsy, awkward, you know, unskilled activation. And this basal ganglia here has a, a, a process, a yin and a yang circuitry that kind of yokes through activation and inhibition to merge together, produce this skilled focusing of a task. And dopamine from the substantia nigra facilitates that. So that's the nature of just a cartoonish representation of how the brain focuses movement in the normal case of events. Uh, there are so many ways in which that can break down. And the basal ganglia, either due to dopamine or basal ganglia intrinsic circuitry itself, no longer is able to perform that selective filtering and focusing of the movement. And the program that you had learned or would want to learn is no longer as selective as you want. Instead, it's, it's unfocused. And then you get this kind of orange, kind of half on, half off of, of everything. That, that's uh, a simplistic representation of what breaks down in the brain to cause the dystonia. Now, why would that basic ganglia fail to produce these dystonic movements? Well, I would consider uh, two main groups of explanation. A hardware problem, something wrong with the, with the circuits in terms of a gross structural breakdown, or else a software problem. So the hardware problem, you could have a stroke in that area, a multiple sclerosis lesion, a tumor, an infection. Those would be the sort of things that can impair the basal ganglia to result in a dystonia as an outcome. Now, usually when people have those diseases, the hardware problems, they are what we call not specific. Person, people who have those also have 
other impairments. They might have weakness or uh, sensory changes because the, the damage is not very specific. Whereas for the software problem, those can be really, very subtle. Something in the program that you trained and learned has become corrupted, and there are various genetic and other causes for that that can be very subtle and can impair just specific motor tasks in this way without causing, excuse me, I'm sorry, weakness or numbness or uh, other impairments of that nature. And there are some genetic diseases. There's a DYT1 mutation. This has been recognized for a couple of decades. The disease has been recognized for more than 100 years, named after Oppenheim. It describes young onset, in, like children age 8 or 9 or 10, starting having, they started in early in life, moving normally, playing, running, riding a bike, and so on. And then around that age, start to, a leg start to contort in, just the ankle maybe initially, and then gradually more and more of the trunk, and then the arm, and then the neck. And that young uh, girl we saw earlier on, she, pro she probably has the Oppenheim DYT1 uh, mutation. That can be inherited. Doesn't what we call penetrate uh, as reliably as, let's say, hemophilia or other penetrant mutations like that, but still can be transmitted from generation to generation and cause this disruption in the motor programming. Now, the basal ganglia, the MRI looks fine, in, in a case of these genetic dystonias like DYT1, uh, the brain under microscope, if you slice it up, looks, looks grossly intact. It's really at a very subtle subcellular level that the activation and the selective programming is just not working quite right. And the result is this progressive dystonia. Antipsychotic medications, classically Thorazine or Melaril or Haloperidol, it, it interfere with dopamine is one thing they do, and dopamine inhibition in that, in that way can lead to downstream changes in how that cyst circuitry works. And having disruption, including dystonia, is a recognized, not a very common, but a recognized side effect of taking antipsychotic medications, so-called classic antipsychotic medications of that nature. And people with Parkinson's disease. So people with Parkinson's disease, deficient in dopamine, sometimes that manifests with, with dystonia as a prime feature. Sometimes it develops later, after use of dopamine. When dopamine levels rise and fall, when we give with medication, levodopa, that can introduce changes in the circuitry that are kind of poor, it, it interrupts or changes or, or alters the learned movement because the way we administer dopamine is not the same as how the body healthily would do so. And the end result is dystonia can evolve as one of the more advanced features of Parkinson's disease in addition. Not always, sometimes. Focal dystonia, as we saw, we saw three of them early in the video. We saw a cervical dystonia, the neck turning to the side, we saw a limb dystonia, and we saw the blepharospasm. For some reason, those, those are quite, quite mysterious. They come on in middle age, fairly commonly, uh, just out of the blue. And there's no, usually no explanation we can come up with. The brain MRI looks normal. If or when the person dies, and this isn't going to kill them, but if they die you know, decades later or have a heart attack, looking at the brain under a microscope looks fine. The brain behavior in every way is normal, except for this dystonia, head turning, left for spasm, so on. So we frankly haven't got a good handle on what's the subtle disruption that for some reason is like a glitch in the uh, software that it happens to come on in middle age for some people, producing these focal dystonias. So I broke those uh, explanations for dystonia into a hardware problem, which is more structural damage to that circuitry, and a software kind of programming subtle impairment. People with Parkinson's disease and Parkinson plus syndromes can have a bit of both, frankly. Some of the circuitry is deteriorated from degeneration, and some of the plastic changes with the neurochemistry and the unlearning and the bad learning can uh, happen as part of Parkinson's as well. So they can have both a software and a hardware problem. Now people with uh, dystonia, it's, it's some, sometimes it's not straightforward to diagnose these things. In fact, for many years it was controversial what was underlying a dystonia. Sometimes it's so counterintuitive that people who are not familiar with it 
that now to me it seems very straightforward. Somebody who ha tries to pick up a pen and then their hand starts to co-contract in this nature, that's very clearly a focal dystonia to me. But uh, that's because I've seen a lot of it. People who hadn't seen a lot of it, and some decades ago, even though it was going on, might see the same thing and say, that doesn't make sense. The person can type, the person can you know, work their fingers, but when they try to pick up a pen and write, they, it kind of draws up like this. That's probably psychological. So for many years, there was a mis misattribution of dystonias to psychology. And uh, for example, the person with the, dis the cervical dystonia turning to the side instead of looking forward, people came up with kind of bizarre ideas that the person fears their future or something of that nature. <laughs> and, and so it was felt that, you know, well, because it seems so odd, when the person, there's this thing called a sensory trick in which you can entrain the sensory motor integration to overcome the dystonia tendency by even fairly gentle touching of a chin, for example. And this is uh, often felt to be, um, well, when, when it was not recognized and the brain was not understood as well as it is nowadays, these were felt to be so bizarre that they didn't make sense and they might be psychological. That's obviously not the case for the vast majority. On the other hand, it is not hard uh, for, for people, for example, and this is not common, but some people for disability or other purposes will you know, do this or do this. It's not hard to, to do that if one wanted to. Not many people want to, but it's not hard to do it. And there's not a good diagnostic test for it. It's a pattern recognition. It's, it, this makes sense is ultimately how we diagnose these things. It's not a, a physiologic test or an imaging test or so on. And there also are a number of people who this is quite... Uh, a whole different topic, but about how psychology impacts motor control. Uh, there is there, the thing I just described there might be considered malingering or fraudulent, and again, uncommon scenario, but I've got to tell you, occasionally it happens. But there is, in addition to that, more commonly, some people who have um, a belief that they cannot control their movements properly, and the, the end result of that will be difficulty controlling their movements. I'm not going to talk too much about that. I might come back a different time to talk about it because it's a whole interesting topic. Distinguishing or disentangling those features in people with, dif with dystonia, I guess is all I'm going to say, it does lead to diagnostic uh, challenges. The other thing I'll mention is people who have uh, soft tissue injuries or musculoskeletal problems or bony problems or joint problems, they can have you know, twisted, contorted muscles of body parts. Uh, scoliosis, for example, could be due to spine deformity. Bony deformity will cause twisted posture. So will dystonia. How do you distinguish between the two? Well, for me, it's uh, an element of how plastic the thing is. So when somebody stops trying to move, for example, lays in bed and, and or, or supports their muscles and doesn't try to move them, how loose they become. And once then they start to activate the muscles, the co-contraction building up, that's of the nature of a dystonia rather than a musculoskeletal problem. Cramps are different. Cramps are more brief, more simple, more, more uh, often... Um, more sudden, they're not, uh, they can be activated by movement, cramps can, but it's not quite the same dynamic. It's not quite as sudden how they build up, and as soon as you stop trying to activate them, it doesn't melt away as instantaneously. So cramps to me look different as well. And they, the cramps are a more peripheral problem in the muscle and nerve peripherally, not in the brain activation. Now having dystonia, as you can imagine, does create problems for a person. First of all, it's painful. Those muscles contracting and drawing in that nature, they're overactive, it's tiring, simply in the muscle themselves. And if they stay contracted too long, those muscles start to hurt. And then the joints and the tissues around them also start to hurt. And if it gets, uh, so pain is one functional impact of it. Second, mobility and getting around and doing anything is going to be impaired. Everything is slower. You can imagine if your limbs are twisted and your leg twisted or trying to write. Everything becomes slower, more impaired, limiting access to things different. There is a risk of injury. Postural stability might be worse. Your fall risk might be higher, for example. The blepharospasm of the, of the eyelids might predispose somebody to trauma, injury, falling or accident. It's got social and occupational impacts, as you can imagine. Ability to perform certain tasks is 
going to be poor, and people's expectation or trust that the person can perform tasks might be reduced. And also it could impact people's appearance and their confidence in social and other relationships. Actually, before I get to a treatment, uh, I wanted to talk, have you visit with Bart here. Uh, Bart, as he'll tell you shortly, has dystonia, and he agreed to describe a little about the impact of this this has had on him. Thanks, Tamara. I can see who, who's out there when I sit down. Yeah. Well, thanks, Bart. So, uh, for a few minutes here, we're going to hear from you, your experience with the dystonia. So, first of all, you've got Parkinson's, I guess. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about your background with that. I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2003. And the dystonia was not an early feature of this? No, it was not. Uh, I had a very benign several first, first several years where the only problem I had was tremors, and it was handled nicely by medication. But then? About uh, oh, maybe a year and a half ago, I started to hunch over a little bit. And I also noticed that I had a tendency to slide, gradually turn to the left. Whether I was standing or sitting in a chair, it, it just as long as I wasn't trying to sit up straight with intent, I would just drift off to the left. And this is, it came out of nowhere, I guess. There was not a particular trigger for this. It wasn't a trauma, injury, fracture, anything of that nature. I had no, uh, no trauma. It just started to come on. Okay. And I believe it's gotten worse as these months have gone on. Yes, it has. And what impact has it had on you? I've... <clears throat> I've given up driving because I can't move my head very fast. And I was an owner of uh, vans and a pickup for many years. And I got so I depended on those side mirrors to tell me what was going on. And I found that I couldn't get around and get a full picture very quickly, which put me at risk of having somebody run into me or me running into somebody because I didn't react fast enough. Uh, I've also had to develop workarounds for various tasks. Uh, I have a tendency late in the evening to have a, a spasm that appears to be related to the dystonia. And so I've got handholds throughout the bedroom and bathroom area that I, I go hand by hand and when one of those spasms hits, it jerks me around to the left. As long as I'm hanging on, I can stop it. But if I have not been concentrating and uh, hadn't worked out what was the cause, I would fall. And I had several falls, oh, six months ago or so, until I figured out how to work around it. And I, I think you're, um, when you want to reach into the fridge, for example, now you're dealing with lower shelves. Or so, isn't that one example of how this limits how you can manage around your home? Yeah, I, I have a woman that comes in five days a week and helps me. And she, for the weekend, she sets up things like salads and puts them down lower shelves of the refrigerator where I can see them. If If I were to, to bring in a small stepladder and, and get up higher where I can look down, I could reach. Yeah, I'm not I, I can just that. about <laughs> reach to the top of my head. Yeah, yeah I, I don't like good, good, good. getting up on steps or stepladders. Now, uh, you use a walker now? Yes. Which wasn't the case a year or two ago before this all started. Basically, that's true. I and with the walker, I think you indicated that it becomes a little bit more easy for you to be a bit more straight than if you, without it, you just double over. Is that fair? That's pretty much true, I think. I, if I'm, when I'm just walking normally with the walker, I can see out about 10 feet and without doing anything special. If I want to see farther, see who's down at the end of the hall or see where the obstacles are, I have to slow down and raise my head up as best I can. Yeah. 
or stop and and put my hands on the walker in a way that yeah, I've got a solid grip and then I step on my get up on my tippy toes and and I can see out like I can see you all here. Now is this painful? No, no pain at all. Good. Um, when you lay on your back, what happens? Can you lay on your back and does, yes. it, does it straighten lay out? Lay on my back or side, there's no effect at all. Sitting here now, I can feel these muscles right here in my abdominal area trying to contract. And the minute I stand up, they scrunch in real tight. And if I were to take my shirt off, you could see the wrinkles that are created by the... Contraction the of these muscles. Tightening of those muscles, yeah. But again, if you lay on your back, does your back straighten out? Yes. Uh, I've just completed a review, PT review, this past summer, and my head would not go completely down right away, but as I lay on the mat about two minutes or so, and I was flat with my head not, not needing a pillow or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, so for treatment of this, uh, in your case, this is secondary to Parkinson's. The Parkinson's medication have not provided relief. Isn't that correct? That's absolutely true. So I tried, uh, was it just once? Uh, once. Botox injection to your, uh, rec your abdominal, uh, frontal abdominal muscles. So my uh, model of what's going on with Bart is that his his basic ganglia trying to send activity down to his truncal muscles to maintain his posture when he stands or when he sits is overflowing to, instead of being focused on his erector muscles and inhibit, inhibiting his flexor muscles, instead there's co-contraction. And because these muscles are stronger, in his case, they are pulling him down and to some extent sideways. And when he quits trying to maintain his posture, if he just lays down, that subsides. So this problem, I don't believe, is due to bony. Obviously, we did an x-ray and see if he had a fracture, because some people with, uh, with age or Parkinson's have kyphosis from bony fractures. You get wedge-shaped, almost collapsing of the vertebrae, and they'll all kind of uh, uh, flex, you know, fracture, uh, and, and, and bend more and more forward. That's not the problem here. His bones are fine. The problem, I believe, is part of his Parkinson basal ganglia activation of his muscles, truncal postural muscles, is now dystonic and producing this. So I tried to inject his abdominal muscles, abdominal wall muscles, and didn't help. Unfortunately, I think his, the muscles that are more important for his trunk flexion are deep down, right in front of his spinal cord, and in front of his vertebrae, and those muscles are not accessible to uh, relief with the Botox injection and injecting these with the amounts that it's safe to use just wasn't powerful enough to alleviate this. It, it was virtually no help at all. I'm sorry about that. Um, one one uh, observation, uh, when I am leaning over uh, and got a good hold on the walker, I can walk with the intent, take long strides, and, and I need to, of course, because of the PD, to keep mm -hmm. stretching those muscles. But uh, the, uh, so the, in terms of my walking, and, and I've been a walker for years, uh, in terms of my walking, I, I don't have any problem stepping right out, and I can probably outwalk two thirds of the people in the room. But uh, the, the handicap, Particularly new uh, locations give me fits. Walmart has recently been rearranging and redesigning their store, and I used to know exactly how to get to whatever I wanted to, and now I walk in the door and I don't recognize any of it, yeah. and, and I have to get up. Sure, those signposts are kind of up there, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you're looking at at least... I, because of the degree of this difficulty this is causing, and it's still a reasonably area in the course of this, and you're otherwise in such good shape and have been uh, that we're looking at brain surgery, isn't that right? Right. And as a matter of fact, uh, just this week on Monday, I got a call from the uh, doctor in Houston, his scheduler, and I'm now scheduled for the 27th of February for 
deep brain surgery. Yeah, so uh, that has a decent chance, though obviously we discussed statistics are, uh, you know, they're, they're certainly far from a guarantee of improvement, but it's the only thing with any realistic potential of reducing this dystonic activ acti activation. So uh, Bart has decided to go for it, and he's got our support, and that's, uh, we sure hope it works out for you. And I'll come back, and Dr. O will tune my system, and we'll see what kind of result we get. Exactly. Well, thanks very much for uh, uh, sharing your experience with the dystonia in this case, and I'll, I'll let you sit back down again. Bart. I'm delighted to do so. Uh, thanks, Bart. Thank you. Uh, so uh, we're going to talk about treatment. Some of them we've already touched on in that uh, brief interview, but uh, we're going to talk about non-pharmacologic treatments. Then we'll touch on some oral medications, botulinum toxin injection, and deep brain stimulation surgery. So backing up to the non-pharmacologic treatments. So if a muscle is contracting, massaging it, stretching it, warm packs, you know, have got to be comforting, particularly if it's aching spasm doesn't undo the problem. The problem is a circuitry problem in the brain. Range of motion exercises might maintain flexibility other, other than which it, it, things can become almost locked in and that does uh, worry me. If somebody is too long in a certain posture or, or condition then the ligaments and the joints just become more fixed in that state. Muscles become shortened. So trying to maintain the full range is a worthwhile uh, goal. But again it's not going to undo the brain tendency to produce the dystonia. Uh, physical therapies have a role in both of the above and to some extent in trying to help with adapting to the difficulty. Occupational therapy and physical therapy I think are helpful to figure work around, well occupational therapy particularly workarounds I, I would consider nature of walker for example or adaptations or what sort of uh, device you might be able to use for doing your task with your uh, hand that's become impaired with dystonia. Uh, there have been there's been certainly been some experimentation trying to use physical therapy modalities to unlearn or relearn how to do a certain task. Force paralysis followed by retraining, but unfortunately has not uh, proven successful. Tamara, do you want to tell us a few words uh, about your experience with treating dystonia? Do you want to come up and... Uh... Well, I mean... It, it's really tough to see, you know, because you, when you look at the patient, you know, you really feel like, oh, they're really in distress, and most of the time they're really not, unless they have some underlying orthopedic issues there. But, um, you know, we try and do some power moves with them, which is kind of yoga moves, and I think over time, you know, working with these patients, we do see an improvement but it only seems like a short-term improvement because if they don't follow through, it's constantly, you know, a, a, it's a battle. So, um, you know, it, uh, you know, I've worked with several people in this room that have it, um, and while they're in clinic, you know, they look better um, for that month that I might see them, but it's not long-term benefit. It really does, the carryover's not there. Um, and I wish it was, um, but I do think power moves would help. Yeah, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I'm a great believer in the benefits of physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy for uh, when they are helpful, and I use them a lot in people with Parkinson's disease, as anybody who's in my practice knows. Uh, for dystonia, I, I, I'm afraid I have the same sense that uh, it's a very temporary benefit, similar to massage. Who can be against? It's you know feeling a little bit better, but it's the benefits are brief enough that I'm I'm afraid that uh, I don't find it. Uh, I don't usually recommend it for my dystonia, uh, specifically for that symptom. The problem at the brain has become almost hardwired in, and unlearning it or relearning it or retraining it just doesn't seem to happen. All right. Then oral medications. So that part of the brain, that uh, basic gang that we're looking at, that in normal case of events has that focus filtering function, the, a number of neurochemicals are involved there, acetylcholine, dopamine obviously, 
um, norepinephrine, gabapentin, and we, with our fairly crude oral pharmacologic therapies, we can shake up the system to some extent, alter the behavior of that system by increasing acetylcholine, reducing NMDA, whatever it is. And people inevitably try these various medications. And for some patients, they help enough to keep taking them. For most patients, the benefit is partial and there are clear side effects. Sedation is almost inevitable side effect of any drug that is going to impact this uh, movement. So the sort of drugs we use are trihexyphenidyl or artane, baclofen, clonazepam, analgesics. And those are fairly standard. If somebody's got painful spasming from dystonia, and again, they'll help a little bit, but they have some side effects. So for an individual patient, whether it's worth taking or not, could go either way. If the problem is dopamine deficiency, which sometimes happens, and actually there's this condition called dopamine responsive dystonia that we always consider. If we see a relatively young person, 20s, 30s, 40s, that looks like they might have Parkinson's disease because they're moving slowly and, and co-contracting and stiffly, and they may have a tremor, we'll use dopamine, and they can become miraculously better. Their problem is not nerve cell deterioration with alpha-synuclein inclusion, nerve cell loss in the basal, in the substantia nigra. Their problem is an inborn error of metabolism in making dopamine. There's an important enzyme that your brain is genetically predisposed to make, and if you get a mutation that inhibits that enzyme, then you don't make dopamine, and then you're going to have dystonic movements. But that's really quite rare. Rare as hen's teeth, almost, relative to the other conditions we see. But occasionally, using levodopa will help that problem, and occasionally it'll help people who have dystonia as a consequence of the Parkinson's disease. In Bart's case, as he told you, it didn't help his particular dystonia. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the mechanism or the pathophysiology is not amenable to such a simple course solution as this. So botulinum toxin injection. The next slide I'm going to show you is going to uh, show you a little bit about uh, botulinum toxin. You might be familiar with the brand name Botox. It's been around for 20 years. There are a number of variations of that. Botox injected into muscle will paralyze that muscle. So if a muscle wants to draw up like so, or a leg or an ankle wants to twist in a certain way, or a jaw or a neck, we can paralyze that muscle that is executing that action, and then the head won't turn, or the hand won't cramp. And that's great. It doesn't fix the underlying problem, which is the, heart, the programming up here in the brain, but it alleviates the abnormal movement downstream, and it reduces the pain and the functional disability. So if we can home in on the overactive muscle, and we can selectively paralyze that with botulinum toxin injection. Botulinum toxins last for two or three months at a time. They'll cause weakness in that muscle, in that body part, which is good and bad. If the muscle is too strong, we can weaken it, and it's good. If the muscle, if we over-weaken it, then the person might have problems, or if the weakness spreads into adjacent muscles, the person might have problems from that. But the effects do wear off in due course, so for patients with painful dystonia, it tends to be a helpful thing. I spend every Wednesday morning injecting various, usually neck, cervical dystonia, in isolation, not in people with Parkinson's disease, is a you know, a significant problem, that woman that we saw earlier, head turning like so, injecting the sternomastoid and some of the rotatory muscles back here alleviates that dystonia and the pain substantially for at least a couple of three months at a time. Again, without getting at the underlying problem up here. And it's relatively free of side effects, not causing sedation or so on. So botulinum toxin injection has a role. Back to Bart's example here. Uh, you know, potentially I could have kept going, injected more sites, more muscles that are accessible, but I had a feeling after first injection and how it didn't help that the problem, the overactive muscles in his case, that he feels cramping up, too many of them were too deep, and this was not going to be a sustainable, effective enough long-term approach, and we needed to go big or go home. So that's what we're doing here with the deep brain stimulation surgery. So we'll talk a little bit about that and how that's used for specifically the symptom of dystonia. This is a video, because I thought, first of all, a number of people here probably have had botulinum toxin injection. Any hands up? Yep, you did. And there you go. I see you again. 
Oh, yeah. So a handful of you. Well, you might be curious about how it works. So this shows, uh, within a microscopic level, within your nerve terminal, this is a vesicle that contains your neurotransmitter. And this white little, small little bubbles coming up, those are calcium coming in. And calcium has an effect on these uh, attachment, the green uh, fibers there, of contracting them to pull down the, the collection of neurotransmitter down to the membrane and release the neurotransmitter, which is this red uh, material here, onto the next neuron or muscle end plate and activate those receptors and cause contraction of the muscles. So that's the normal course, that's how normal muscle contraction happens. This is how Botox works, botulinum toxin. This is the Botox molecule, this thing. It comes into the, into the nerve terminal like so. It a little bit breaks off. And that little bit goes and it starts cutting. It acts, it acts like a, a snipper, a scissor. It's very selective for a particular target on a protein. It recognizes the molecular shape of this, what's called a snare complex, which is important for, the, for, for fusing the, the receptor, um, the vesicle to the uh, end plate. Well, so the end result is that if you inject Botox, the, uh, the uh, nerve no longer releases the neurotransmitter and no longer activates the muscle contraction. And that's a relatively lasting solution. Once you clip those uh, fibers that draw down the neurotransmitter and release it onto the muscle membrane, it lasts for, again, a couple or three months before you regrow new nerve terminals, frankly. So botulinum toxin injection, here is a cervical dystonia, the head turning, and that's the sternomastoid muscle right there, and it's relatively easy to inject the needle tip, inject a certain amount of botulinum toxin. It works, it's very targeted. The relief is just that muscle that you're injecting. Maybe a slight bit of leakage to adjacent muscles, but really you can target it without causing brain side effects or GI or liver or kidney. It's really very localized therapy, I think. And it does last for a number of months. Problem is if you get excessive weakness and if you injure somebody with a needle. Now that muscle is right there on the surface, but some of these mu muscles that we want to inject are deeper down and they're nerves, they're blood vessels, there are other tissues that are, one is concerned about injuring. So it, that constrains one a little bit about the risks of that. It could introduce an infection potentially, thankfully it hasn't happened, but it's uh, potentially. And then cost. Botox is extremely expensive. At treatment of that nature, paying out of pocket would be of the order of a couple of thousand dollars. And then a couple, three months later, same again. Now, insurance does cover it, but it still is a substantially expensive treatment. So we only do it if somebody's problems are bad enough and the relief is good enough to merit that risks and costs and so on. When botulinum toxin injection doesn't work and the medications don't work, well then we look at deep brain stimulation surgery. So we're ramping up to this is the kind of biggest gun we have essentially in treating a dystonia. Now deep brain stimulation surgery, as you know, is used to treat a number of other problems. It's used to treat essential tremor. It's used to treat many of the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease, including the resting tremor, the dyskinesias, bradykinesia, rigidity. The target, the mechanism, well, Okay, so deep brain stimulation, uh, the mechanism is there's a, a neurostimulator, sometimes called a battery pack or pacemaker or implantable pulse generator, in the chest wall, and it has a wire connecting up to the skull, and then another wire that d dives into the brain, and on the tip of that wire, there's an electrode through which current will, the current will flow. And that current flow impacts the nerve activity in those in the adjacent area. Let's say for a, a centimeter, you know, diameter sphere around that tip of that electrode. If you send, depending on how you program it, if you send energy there, you're going to affect the nerve activity in that area. Now, this was discovered a certain amount in first principles about neurophysiology, and a certain amount in animal studies, and then in. Uh, in research experiments, initially in France, about 1980s or so, that put this probe into certain parts of the brain in people with Parkinson's disease, we could eliminate tremor right here, move it over here, it could eliminate dyskinesias. And so a certain amount of um, back and forth between you know, research theory and testing in the field has got us to a place that we have 
uh, some guidelines, some rules, some heuristics that certain problems, if this or that doesn't work, then we can look at deep brain stimulation to this part of the, this particular focus of the brain, this particular subnucleus, and there's a, a matter of probability we can improve this or that symptom. There's a risk involved, of course, with deep brain stimulation surgery. The surgeon implanting that probe without getting too into the weeds can hit a blood vessel, cause an infection, do other sorts of damage like so. And it's expensive as all get out. The surgery and the hardware is tens of thousands of dollars. And every few years, the battery pack has to be changed. And sometimes it starts to deteriorate or get infected and has to come out again and redo again. So it's an it's expensive proposition. But when it works, it's very gratifying. And it accomplishes a more stable state of affairs than medications can do. It's just a more continuous and more subtle, more focused effect than flooding the system with uh, the whole system with medication levels that rise and fall and frankly, are more than you need in many cases to get enough to that part of the brain that you want. So this is a, another example of a focal therapy. For dystonia, we usually use what's called the GPI, Globus pallidus interna, is often the target symptom, and that's the target symptom in Bart's case as well. And this is, again, based on cumulative evidence around the world that there's uh, more probability of a good outcome with you know, this uh, target. And this is a young person who had a dystonia, had a good response to it, and this, you know, they interviewed in the local news and so on. This person didn't, of course, have Parkinson's disease. But. A medical milestone for one Aiken family had their nine-year-old son going from being wheelchair-bound to walking again. The procedure that made this possible is something called deep brain stimulation. Our news host Trishna Begum shows us the before and after results. Trishna. Well, Lindsay, that procedure was done here at GHSU. Now, nine-year-old Nathan Simmons has something called dystonia, which means the things that you and I do pretty easily every morning, like write our errands down for the rest of the day or brush our teeth. Well, they're incredibly hard for him to do because he couldn't control his movements. Nathan Simmons loves playing football. He's as energetic as they come at nine years old, but the mere fact that he's walking today is quite the feat for him. It was an unbelievably difficult journey, and we love you know Nathan so much. A closer look at Nathan, and you'll notice something different. He has a device that protrudes out of the left side of his chest. It was put there after he had surgery in early November. I fell a little back because every time I bent over, it was hard to get back up, and every Every time I like, took a step, I would fall over. Last year, he could barely hold a pen and write out letters. By summer of 2011, he was restricted to a wheelchair. Every move was a struggle. Doctors at Georgia Health Sciences diagnosed him with a neurological movement disorder called dystonia. If you flex your arm, that's his whole body. When his brain tries to connect with his, um, his muscles, when he walks, his entire muscles cramp up in his leg. He had been treated with medication. But nothing was working and he was getting worse. That's when doctors recommended something called deep brain stimulation. My initial reaction was whatever it's going to take. Deep brain stimulation is the insertion of wires deep into the brain at specific locations. Surgeons also attach that pacemaker which stimulates the end of the wires. With electricity that jam the circuits that cause dystonia, that cause the abnormal movements. It's a procedure that restored much of Nathan's movement, and even though doctors said it would take about six months, Nathan was walking by Thanksgiving. For it to happen within two weeks, from a wheelchair to walking and running in football. Just seeing my dad looking at me and saying, and um, saying that I walk, that made me feel good. Some pretty incredible technology that's allowing him to do things he's never done before. He wants to get into sports, wants to do some karate. No contact, of course, because he needs to protect that pacemaker, which comes with a battery pack that should last him several years. Lindsay? Just so heartwarming. What a transformation. All right. Thank you. <laughs> she kind of overdoes it a little bit, I think. But um, the, I don't know. Anybody recognize that neurosurgeon, any chance? So he was a partner here at UC Southwestern, and he was our functional neurosurgeon 
about 15, 20 years ago, and then he went off to Georgia. Um, anyway, um, that outcome, that you know, miraculous almost outcome, is about a 65% probability a young person like that. And that was the odds they accepted going in, and he got it. He got a home run, and again, that, that uh, can happen. Uh, they, uh, with age and aging and other, in other backgrounds, as we've talked about, it, the uh, probability is not that high, but it's still substantial. And so that's a judgment an individual person has to make. Is that likelihood of a good outcome worth the risks, the costs, the inconvenience, and so on? Obviously, the risks primarily. I'll talk about, if we talk about dystonia in principle and most often in the pure uh, culture of people who don't have Parkinson's disease. For the last 10 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about people who have Parkinson's disease, about manifestation and management of dystonia in those cases. So people with Parkinson's disease have dystonia. Fake, focal foot dystonia is probably the most uh, common, toes and, and ankle curling in like so. Uh, eyelid dystonia causing blepharospasm would be less common. Uh, truncal dystonia would be even less common again, or significant truncal dystonia above and beyond uh, you know, a certain amount of hunch, kyphosis, stoop that I wouldn't call dystonia. And then a whole body contort of generalized dystonia we can see on occasion as manifestation of somebody who has simple Parkinson's disease. Now, some people with Parkinson's disease, the dystonia is, is dynamic or cyclic. It happens as the dopamine levels fall. And obviously, that's most likely to happen a number of hours after your last dose of levodopa. So take levodopa, get on, able to move better, and then the medications wear off. You can get tremor, certainly, but also sometimes dystonia. Can be in a foot, can be in a trunk, can be in a leg. Whether that dystonia is a big enough part of the problem of wearing off, or just you know the fifth biggest part of the problem of wearing off, is individual. It tends to be worse in the early morning, probably because that's when the dopamine levels are at their lowest. Uh, three or four in the morning, somebody waking up with toe cramping. That's not unusual as part of a phenomenon of people with Parkinson's experiencing a dystonia. And the younger brain is actually more prone to dystonia than the older brain. Classically, your 40-year-old gets Parkinson's disease is fairly likely to manifest with the dystonia, whereas your 60 or 70-year-old who gets new onset Parkinson's disease I mean, dystonia is not, uh, not, not as likely to be a presenting symptom. And that probably reflects something about the plasticity, susceptibility of the brain, the young brain, more plastic tendency than the older brain. And then there are the Parkinson plus conditions. So you guys are probably a little bit familiar with the, uh, these variations in Parkinson's disease, progressive supranuclear palsy, corticobasal degeneration, and those cases actually tend to have higher tendency towards dystonia. Corticobasal, classically, will cause a hemibody dystonia that become really very severe, and the dystonia in that case ac actually fairly quickly becomes baked in and, and fixed in with rigidity and becomes a contracture. It, it's so severe so quickly that the person becomes really quite con contracted. So how do we treat people with Parkinson's disease for their dystonia? If we can identify that falling dopamine is the problem, we try to prevent dopamine from falling. So we look at various tricks of the trade, let's say. So there's longer acting formulations of dystonia. There's the new capsule Ritari, which tends to have a longer you know, circulating half-life. With the timing of when we administer the medication, some of the adjunctive medications to extend the action for example, enticapone or COM10 inhibits the breakdown. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors like Azelect can inhibit the breakdown as well and extend the duration of dopamine effect. And sometimes once a day, dopamine agonists such as primipexol or apinerol. Now, unfortunately, those medications usually don't pack enough punch to uh, alleviate. To, to, they don't trigger the dopamine system as effectively as levodopa. So often, even though they can uh, support dopamine effect, they don't alleviate these symptoms quite well enough, and they are prone to side effects too. Sometimes we'll use the muscle relaxants, tonazepam, baclofen, xanaflex, and so on. And as in other 
patients who don't have Parkinson's disease, we sometimes use these uh, treatments, the Botox injection, as in this case, or deep brain stimulation. If the dystonia is all over, you can't do Botox everywhere, and if it's affecting inaccessible muscles, too deep or too close to important tissues that cannot be safely accessed with a needle, or if person, in addition to having dystonia, has other features that might be responsive to deep brain stimulation, tremors, dyskinesias, and so on. That might be justifications for thinking about deep brain stimulation in somebody with Parkinson's disease to alleviate dystonia and other problems. All right, so what we've covered here in the last hour plus is uh, some of the features of dystonia. Hopefully you have a bit of an understanding about where it came from and how it can happen and how it can impact somebody and some of the treatments that are available to it. So it's a, it's a sustained overactivation because of unfocused contractions. Too many muscles are co-activated to cause this abnormal contorted posture and impairs function and becomes you know, painful. And it's due to this impairment of the focusing function, which is the central task of the basal ganglia. It breaks down in a certain way to manifest with this unfocused movement. And there can be genetic causes. Antipsychotic medications can cause it. And neuro neurologic generations can cause it. it. Impairs functions, painful, social, occupational consequences. And we looked at some of the treatments, medications, physical modalities, botulinum toxin injection, deep brain stimulation. And in Parkinson's disease, we try to mitigate it and other problems with adjusting dopaminergic medication. That's all I wanted to cover in the presentation. I'll pause and take your questions. Thank you. I noticed you had up there uh, the apomorphin, but you didn't mention anything about it. What are, you, what are your thoughts about that? Uh, so apomorphine is an injection of a dopamine agonist that quite quickly, within five or ten minutes, gets into the system and can convert a person from being off to being on. So people with Parkinson's disease who are enter an off state, who want to get on within minutes rather than wait half an hour for the oral medication to take effect, can use apomorphine injection. For people who have dystonia as part of that off state, then potentially alleviating that dystonia by doing an injection can affect it quicker. So it has a role. It's uh, not very convenient for many patients to self-administer the injection. It is very expensive. It is prone to some side effects. The management of and adjustment of and the degree of relief from shortening your off period, sometimes with dystonia from you know, 30 minutes down to 10 minutes, something of that nature, that may be worth it for some patients. For many patients, it's that's not a great solution. But it, 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 it might be for certain patients. Doc, doctor, a uh, question for you. What's down the road beyond deep brain? No, it's a good question. The, um, so there's, there's, there's pretty exciting research on uh, Parkinson therapies, and other neuro neurologic generations, Huntington's, other conditions using antisense oligonucleotides, so-called, those are uh, therapies that can block the uh, process mRNA protein production that underlies a lot of neurologic, a number of neurologic generations. So that uh, therapies are looking quite intriguing as part of getting at, you know, the more fundamental problems of neurologic generations. Antibody infusion therapies to try to remove accumulated uh, disrupted proteins. We didn't get into it today, but there are certain proteins, not dietary proteins, but intrinsically generated proteins that accumulate, alpha synuclein being one of them, and antibodies that can be infused to draw those down. That's happening right now. We're testing it, and it you know, maybe it'll turn out, we try to be cautious, guarded in our optimism. I mean, it's, 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 it's exciting in many ways, and maybe it will turn out to be a, a good thing, but many things that we've hoped to be a, good, you know, a fix for, for these neurologic generations over the past you know, decades have not transpired yet, so we're, we're still working on it. In terms of dystonia specifically, that's sort of a, a circuitry breakdown, the software breakdown. Uh, it, that circuitry is really so subtle and so complex that I don't think we have a real in on 
the very microscopic subcellular solution uh, that I that uh, uh, I me mean, I consider brain circuitry of this nature the last frontier in terms of you know science really of understanding about how you know we evolved to uh, have processes of this nature and how to intervene in them when they break down. And we are a long way from that, I'm sorry to say, have that level of, at the, at the subcellular level of intervening with the, you know, a, a, a tiny solution. So the solutions we have, I freely admit, are somewhat coarse. Flood the brain with a certain neurochemical, stimulated in a certain way, they're very, really, you know, we look back at these, you know, generations as being, mm, wow, it's, you know, really quite coarse solutions, but they're the best we've got. And they're, they're not bad. Yeah, they're certainly better than we had a couple of decades ago. So, again, we're working on it. Uh, doctor, how yes. frequent is, is um, Estonia among, Parkin among Parkinson patients? That's a good question. Uh, Depending on how broadly you want to characterize it, I would say everybody with Parkinson's disease, maybe not at the very earliest feature, you know, year or two, but you could say just about everybody has overflowed co-contraction and difficulty selectively activating the muscle as the disease goes on. Now, for many patients, this is really a minor enough problem relative to, frankly, a number of the other motor difficulties. Uh, but depending on, you know, how... Uh, lower level of, uh, I think it's actually very common. And now again, we, we use the dopaminergic medication and the physical activities I do think do help uh, uh, Stony as well as many of the other motor symptoms. I'm a believer in the big exercise, the boxing, the aerobic exercises and, and the maintaining posture and so on. And, and those sort of housekeeping things I think do help that level of dystonia in the many patients with Parkinson's who have dystonia as one of their features. So I would say just about everybody with Parkinson's disease, some even at the first year, more often by the, by the time we're getting in the mid-stage, have some degree of dystonia. But not every one of them is dystonia the biggest quality of life issue. For Bart here, it's his biggest quality of life issue, um, the functional impairment of that. But that's not common, that uh, dystonia becomes, shoots up to become the number one problem. Sorry. Yes. Um what is your view relative to stem cell replacement for treatment of dystonia or Parkinson's? Okay, um, so taking you know fresh new cells from whatever source and putting them into the brain, which is uh, missing certain cells or cells are not working right, has been an intriguing possibility for a few decades now. Um, it hasn't panned out yet. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. There are a number of technical reasons, difficulty in you know, culturing these things, converting them into proper dopamine producing neurons or growth factor or whatever else the stem cells are trying to accomplish. But the bigger, fun and, th and those problems have been largely solved. But even when those problems are solved and these stem cells, whether they're from fetal cells or human adipose tissue, of uh, any, any source, you can, you can, the technology for making stem cells is actually I think we got that down. The, tech, the process of making those stem cells act the way you want them to act is, we're nowhere with that. Because partly it's partly a rewiring problem, a training problem that uh, you know, practice doesn't necessarily do that. These neurons don't know how to integrate into the system. To me, I consider it like if somebody's got a hardware problem with the computer and get a number of wires, fresh wires, perfectly fine wires, and, and open the case and, and put them in without knowing how to, you know, rewire them correctly, which we have no knowledge how to do that, or how to train them to program correctly. And then there's a whole new problem. Sorry to be a bit of a downer here, but Parkinson's, the uh, protein accumulation, unfortunately, seems to affect those implanted stem cells. So the Parkinson degeneration affects those in the first number of years in addition. So stem cells have not uh, met, lift, uh, lived up to the uh, promise of the uh, last couple of decades, as far as I'm concerned. Now, I still hope, hopefully, they work out, but I think it's, they're not the most promising thing. If I had to you know, invest in uh, technology, let's say, be looking at the ASOs or something of that nature. Question here? Yes, Dr. O. 
question? Sure. Not that I have any experience in this, but I've read a lot of, lately about medical marijuana or mm -hmm. CBD oil expanding mm -hmm. the country. Yeah. Is there any studies or any information about medical marijuana helping the dystonia or Parkinson's? Uh, not that I've seen, but I've heard a lot of anecdotal so-called, you know, people saying that it helps, and I, I don't doubt it. Uh, I consider um, marijuana and, uh, you know, for example, clonazepam, clonopin, Valium-type drugs, they will alleviate, you know, tension, effort, agitation, which amplify the difficulties in many people who have dystonia or Parkinson's in general. And so I could see very easily that same as Valium, same as a glass of Pinot Grigio, or, or same as kind of, kind of, that it would alleviate some of those symptoms. Now, whether or not, it, it kind of this does have, you know, fundamental, bio, well, it has symptom, it has effects on neurotransmitters throughout the brain in a very complex circuitry that we don't fully understand. Uh, I'm a bit skeptical that it's the cure-all that, um, is, you know, some people believe it is, and there's not good scientific data of a benefit in Parkinson's or dystonia, but there's a lot of people who say, wow, it helps me feel better, I feel like I'm functioning better, I'm happy for him, you know. Do you know if there's... Sorry, follow, let me follow up on that, because somebody said there, so maybe you get prescriptions. But just uh, for clarification, in the state of Texas, it's actually not possible for me to prescribe it, or my medical board will uh, have my head. So uh, it's, uh, if people want to do it, you know, knock themselves out, but I can't uh, prescribe it. Uh, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Are you aware of any success with the focused sonogram on dystonia treatment or Parkinson's treatment? Is that the MRI uh, facility focused ultrasound? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, hasn't been tested in dystonia as far as I'm aware, so that's a less invasive. I mean, you don't break the skin. Essentially, you don't, you know, drill a hole as for deep brain stimulation. Instead, you guide a, a ultrasound, almost like a gamma ray, almost to the target area uh, of the brain, and can, can alter the behavior of it. It's used for treating tremor. It's not widely available, partly because it's not uh, paid for by insurers, including Medicare. However, it's helpful for tremors, and it's less invasive and therefore less dangerous than deep brain stimulation surgery. There's essentially no risk of bleeding and so on. It's, it's not available in many places in the country, frankly, and the long-term benefits for tremor are un indeterminate. They're, they're quite good for the first couple of months. Even by a year, they're still reasonably good. Uh, we don't know much longer than that. Hasn't been done in dystonia, as far as I'm aware and has been used for Parkinson's symptoms more generally, dyskinesias, bradykinesias, and so on, purely for tremor, both in and outside Parkinson's disease. And if there are patients who tremor is refractory treatments, but they don't want the brain surgery, or frankly, they're not in good shape to get the invasive brain surgery, then the focused ultrasound you know, is a legitimate option. A number of my patients, I am facilitating them going to another site, but they have to pull out the checkbook because insurers are not paying for it. Um, I was wondering if uh, about behavioral therapy, learning relaxation techniques, meditation, mindfulness training, would any of that be helpful? It'll be helpful for relaxation and for um, which will alleviate, you know, because the more energy you're sending through that and the more frustrated a person gets, the more co-contraction. Frankly, it turns into a little bit of a, the more you try to do something and the more it overflows, then you try to overcome that by trying harder, the more it overflows, and it becomes this battle between good and evil going on, and the best thing you can do is just quit trying. In a similar way, you know, relaxation, mindfulness, biofeedback will quiet things down, but they won't rewire and make the problem go away. Next time you try, you're back to square one, I believe. Does loss of vision affect level spasms? Uh, Oh, does loss of vision affect uh, blepharospasms? Uh, not, not in the classic... Uh, most patients, let's say, who have blepharospasm, uh, their, their, their vision is 20-20. That's not the problem. You know, once their eyelids are out of the way. Uh, presumably, if you have vision loss for whatever source, in addition, now you've got two problems. But I don't think that stonia the tendency of the basic ganglia to cause this excessive contraction is due to vision impairment, if that's your question. I'm just, I was just wondering why they seem to de the blepharospasm seem to decrease 
as the vision goes down. Um, do you mean if they're wearing dark glasses, for example, and they're, you know? Uh, I don't know if, if we're, well, like I said, if you're trying to do something, trying to write, try to walk, uh, that's when the co-contraction happens. If you're not trying to open your eyelids because you don't care to open their eyelids because it doesn't matter either way, whether they're open, closed, then I, I guess you probably have less blepharospasm. But it's, um, that's not a common scenario I run into. Most of the patients I'm seeing with it still can see and they're still trying to keep their eyes open, but it just turns into this tendency to tighten close. There's a question back here. I was wondering if you had any um, further information, like on a subcutaneous pump that's um, actually giving the levodopa on a more consistent basis in relation to the dystonia. Uh, no, I, thank you. Um, so administering, this has been a, a, a goal for a few decades to instead of taking t tablets three times a day or whatever it is, or even if you take them every three hours or whatever it is, it's still a rise and fall. So if you could administer a microscopic amount every minute, you know, either by mouth or any other solution, so there's, it is, has been a dream. Uh, levodopa doesn't work well intravenously, it's kind of toxic on the veins and it's not, uh, but having a there is the uh, duodenal infusion pump, which will administer into your GI system at a very regulated, steady state, which is close to what your brain wants. I'm going to sidebar here for a second, saying that close to what your brain wants is, is the background baseline, which is important for maintenance. To learn, you have to be able to surge it, in, but in very microscopic, sub-microscopic, uh, millimeter and uh, you know both distribution and time and that's not possible with any therapies we give but if we can give a steady state background that'll that'll get you most of the way there in terms of maintaining function we believe uh, the mobility and including dystonia and the tremors and stuff now the duodenal infusion there still are barriers to absorption and integration into your system that will cause rising and falling levels. Your system will ramp up, chew it up, you know, it, it'll, it won't be exactly steady state. The infusion subcutaneously will bypass one of the sources of variation, which is GI motility and GI absorption and competition from dietary protein. So that's, that's an improvement. Uh, if it's, we haven't used it, I haven't used it. Uh, I, uh, I've little doubt that it's better, more stable, and you know, helpful than oral medication. Uh, whether it's the added benefits or worth the expense and the inconvenience and the mechanical problems with it and so on, it's it's jury still out in that. Let's say because for most people, certainly for the first many years of Parkinson's disease, taking pills by mouth because the body has a buffering system and you get a, a yeah, it's rising and falling, but the body can buffer that and deal with it, and people still do well. Many people for many years with simple old pills, you know, and it's convenient and practical and so on. So the infusion may end up superseding that at some stage, but it still is, uh, it's, it's certainly not mainstream yet. And I, I, I think it would be a good thing. I think it would be mar um, a little bit better than the oral pills. For some patients, it might be a bit more than a little bit better. Um, I what about the baclofen pump? I have a sister who has cerebral palsy, and a couple of years ago, she was to a point where she was using her scooter. Yeah. And now she's back to a straight cane. So yeah. what is, has that been utilized at all? Yeah. Thank you for reminding me. Yes, you're right. That's, that's a good... I might have added that to my slide. The uh, oral baclofen does inhibit... Uh, um, some of the dystonic uh, tendency... And if you take it by mouth, it'll flood the whole system, the whole body, including the whole brain, and it'll be a bit sedating. But it does help reduce dystonias. For most patients who have dystonias, side effects greater than benefits, we might try it or we might not, depending. Sometimes it helps some. Now, intrathecal baclofen, injecting it continuously into a pump, usually in the lumbar spine, is a workaround that avoids flooding the whole brain. Even though it's in the spinal fluid, it might get to the brain. Enough of it stays locally and is used up locally that people don't get the same level of sedation. So it helps for people who have lower body dystonia to get a intrathecal baclofen pump. So if somebody's legs, feet are particularly dystonic, uh, that's something we sometimes try. 
We, try, we start with the oral baclofen, see if it helps. But if we run into side effects with sedation, then we'd say, well, we can work around. We can get you the baclofen to the overactive nerves in your lumbar cord and thoracic cord and less and uh, affect your feet particularly. It doesn't, that doesn't help with the upper body or even the upper trunk uh, dystonia. The, it, the site of the uh, implant has been, always has been, well, maybe I shouldn't say always has been, uh, it's very rare, I think, that it's implanted higher up. Interesting uh, thought. Uh, you know, we do, haven't used it. Uh, we've, I've used it for people with lower body dystonia, including cerebral palsy, but I should, I should think about that a bit more. Thank you. Is the use of baclofen in a stroke the same as using it for dystonia? That's a good question. So uh, dystonia can happen secondary to stroke if it affects that part of the brain, but usually strokes are uh, a bit crude in terms of an insult to the brain. It affects other circuitry as well, and often there's spasticity in addition and, and weakness and so on. When you've got a complex outcome but uh, as a result of a stroke, if overactivity of muscles is one of the secondary down co uh, consequences, then yes, baclofen can help. Whether or not we're going to call that exactly dystonia, it's not a pure example of dystonia, let's say. There may be dystonia, there may be spasticity, there may be both. Baclofen is one of the solutions we will look at uh, for that solution. It's again, uh, reduces overactivity of muscles, uh, muscles and nerves for whatever reason. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. O, Thank you. for spending your time with us.